Okay. All right, this is an interview at the New Scotland Historical Society. It is the 26th of September, 2007, approximately 11.30 a.m. Interviewers are Mike Russert and Wayne Clark. Could you give me your full name, date of birth, and place of birth, please? My name is Robert J. Curo, C-U-R-E-A-U. Date of birth is 6125, and it was an entire town of New York in Westchester County. Okay. What was your educational background prior to entering service? I had one year of college. All right. Where was that? Cornell. Cornell. Okay. Um, where were you when you found out about Pearl Harbor? Home. It was, of course, a Sunday. We were just about to have dinner, and then we were sitting in the living room, and came on the radio. Mm -hmm. Do you remember a reaction to that? Well, at the time. it was certainly a shock, mm -hmm. no question about that. I just didn't know what to make of it. Mm -hmm. Did you know where Pearl Harbor was? Probably not. Mm -hmm. I don't recall. Yeah. Okay. No. Okay. Um, did you enlist or were you drafted? I enlisted. Why? Well, I wanted to go in the uh, Air Corps. I wanted to be a hot pilot, and that was the best medium for me. Okay. Um, did you, had you ever flown prior to? No, when not, so not Why did you have this interest? No, I, I don't know. It just seemed like a fun thing to do, <laughs> I guess. Okay. Um, where did you go for your, when did you enlist? Uh, okay, I'm going to look okay, at my, uh, my cheat sheet. I enlisted in the, in the fall of uh, 43, and I was inducted in January of 44. And I went into active service actually at February 10th and 44. Okay. Where did you go for basic training? Well, I went in originally to Fort Dix, and Fort Dix went to Greensboro, North Carolina. That uh, was an overseas replacement depot and a training center for uh, basic training for the Air, Army Air Corps. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Now, how long were you there? About six weeks. And what was your basic training like? Well, I've just been in the process of watching uh, Ken Burns' documentary, and compared to what the Marines went through, and the and the and this was a Boy Scout camp. <laughs> it really was. We had uh, it was just marching. We marched a lot, drilled that sort of thing. Um, left face, right face, about all of this, and also that was at the, the point where we had our tests. They had physical and mental, like mm -hmm. test, see if you qualify. And that, well, I don't know, the mental part of it was pretty normal, but the physical part was depth perception and balance and mm -hmm. so forth. Mm -hmm. you know. And most of us uh, passed. And uh, at that point, they took us out to the, uh, to the firing range, and we qualified with 45s. So we knew we were going to be officers, and uh, then shortly after, and then we took some pre-flight uh, classes. And shortly after that, within a couple of weeks, they, we were loaded into uh, trucks and taken back out to the uh, firing range to qualify with carbines. <laughs> and we knew something was up when that happened. As it turned out, uh, they had made the decision at that point that they had enough pilots. This was in the fall, or spring of '44, and they were discontinuing pilot, pilot training. At least that's what we were told. Mm -hmm. So at that point, we were sent, some of us were sent out, I suppose, based on our aptitude, sent out to uh, Scottfield, Illinois, which is right across from St. Louis, for training in high-speed uh, cold radio. And we were there for. Well, a little over 22 weeks, and in that process, uh, we learned how to typewrite, or typewriter, and we learned how to take coal. And uh, at six, at 16 words a minute, they put the two together. Now, up until that point, when you got a signal like a hey, da da, you just automatically write it, mm -hmm. and you had that reflex. Well, now you had to change that reflex so when you heard the I, you hit the right key on the typewriter. And that was a challenge. Mm -hmm. But we, we got through that and uh, we got up to 25 words a minute, which is pretty high speed 
in, in text and uh, 30 words a minute in uh, ruling of that in weather. And from there we went to well, Selfridge Field, must have been in Wichita, Texas. And that was an overseas replacement depot. And we were there for several months. Um, what did you do there? Not much of anything, really. Just waited to be That's called up and shipped overseas. Up. Yeah, and we were kind of impatient, played a lot of poker and uh, went into town a lot mm -hmm. and so forth, but it, uh, didn't have any assignments, no responsibility. We had a couple of fellows who were particularly good playing poker and, uh, and uh, so they'd get into this game that was perpetually going on in one of the barracks. Mm -hmm. and, uh, Particularly at the end of the month, we were short of money, and we'd stake Frank and, and Bob in the poker game. And then when they signaled they were ahead, why we'd come in and say, The sergeant's looking for you, we got a report. <laughs> so we'd put, pull them out of the game and then proceed to go into town. We'd fight in Star Trek. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> in, uh, what was it? In, it must have been, uh, well, we, I departed for overseas in January of 25. So uh, it was six months, and I didn't put this together, but six months or so in, uh, in Scott Field it would put me in the fall of fall, of, late fall of uh, 44, and we didn't go overseas until 45, mm -hmm. January 45. Mm -hmm. And we flew over. We uh, went from, we went to Fort Totten on Long Island and got in a C-54, which was one of the larger planes in those days. And we flew to Gandor, Newfoundland, and the snow was just piles high. I'll never forget it. We were snowed in, as a matter of fact. Stayed there overnight. The next morning, we flew to the Azores and guessed up there. And then we flew to Casablanca, Morocco. And we stayed there for several days, got in to see the town. Of course, that was after Roosevelt and Churchill had met there a year before, so that was well known. And then we flew from there to Cairo, Egypt, and we were there for several days, and we saw Cairo, we saw the Sphinx and the Pyramids. You think it was a, a Grand Circle tour. <laughs> and then from there, we went to Karachi, India, and uh, at that point, I remember, because we were in a transient location, and there was a field uh, next to our area, and tall grass. And at one point, we could see this grass moving, and it seemed like about a 50-foot swath was moving through that grass. And we had no idea what it was. I still don't know today, but I was very glad I didn't have to pull guard duty that night. <laughs> And we went on to Delhi, and uh, we stayed overnight there. And our transient area was a was a basha, which was a thatched roof affair open on both ends. And at night, we usually hung our clothes on a, a frame of, on a pole that held a mosquito netting. And the next morning, we got up, and uh, all the, the natives had padded through the basha uh, during the night and taken all the pants off. <laughs> took them out in the field, adjacent field, and rifled through them and dropped them. So there were about 30 of us, all dressed except for pants, out in this field trying to find our <laughs> the right pants. Um, wound up in Shamwa, uh, Assam province in India. That is where China and Burma, India come together. And uh, let's see, we were assigned to what was known as the AACS, Army Airways Communication System. And this was, this related to flying material over, over the hump from China into Japan to support Chiang Kai-shek and his troops. Now, the Japanese had shut off the Burma Road uh, the Lado Road they were constructing, but that was an engineering nightmare through the jungles. So the only way they could get material to China 
to support Chiang Kai-shek was by air. So they established the, uh, an airlift and they established the Air Transport Command, ATC, to operate it. And the Army Airways Communication System was the unit, a separate unit, I'm not sure why, that they were radio operators. And we would monitor the flights of the planes over the hump. Now, I guess it's appropriate to point out that the enemy at that point, 44, was weather and the height of the mountains. Well, the C-46s and C-47s were the major planes on our field, and the C, the, those, the, the uh, altitude limit on the C-47 was something like 24,000 feet, and these mountains approached that. Two-engine plane, of course, DC-3s, mm -hmm. you know, and loaded with the, the, the ups, the drafts, the, the current air currents were awful, and of course, monsoons lasted anywhere from four to six months, torrential rains. And these planes, they would, some of these pilots would fly three trips a day. It was 500 miles from Kunming to, from from Java to Kunming, and they would make three trips a day over this terrain. Uh, what they would do would take off and they would radio us. We would sit at a, at a, at a desk with a helicraft or radio on a, an assigned frequency. And these planes, understand, were leaving one right after the other just as fast as they could and landing the same way. And as they left, they would call in on our frequency. Well, they were, probably had eight or ten frequencies. They would call in and say, this is Flight 4736, uh, leaving, leaving uh, Chamba at such and such a time, and uh, that ETA would be such and such. And we would write that out on a slip of paper and then pass that over to the Air Transport Command personnel who had big maps, uh, not unlike this, I guess, and they would follow the monitor these flights over, uh, over, the, over the mountains. And uh, then they would fly a certain time and then they would cross a checkpoint and they would call in and they'd say we're crossing checkpoint 207 at such and such a time and, uh, and they'd call in the next checkpoint. Finally they'd get over there and they would verify their arrival and they would do the same thing right back. And this was constantly going, constantly going on. But it was not unusual to have a plane ice up and if they, the first thing they do, if they couldn't control the plane and it really started to go down, they would dump the cargo. And if that didn't work, then they would bail out. And the, um, the last thing that the radio operator, there were three on each plane, it was a pilot, co-pilot, and radio operator. And the radio operator would uh, tie a key down to give a constant tone so that they could shoot bearings on that plane to determine where it was, or, you know, located. And then you'd sit there, but at the meantime, if we had that situation, which is a mayday situation, you'd clear the frequency of all, all the contact, and you'd just be dealing with this plane. If they were going down, and you'd just hear this uh, tone, then it would stop, and then you knew that that plane was down in that jungle or in those mountains someplace. And many of these areas weren't even explored. They had no idea whether, whether they were inhabited or not or what the inhabitants, might, who the inhabitants might be. And they were down there in that jungle and a lot of them were down. And I suppose they were probably walking out of there for years after. An effort was made to locate them and bring them back, but mm -hmm. again, in a wartime situation, that was limited. Um, now, when you worked, how many hours did you have on? How many hours did you have off? We had something like six hours on, six hours off, six hours, six hours on, six hours off, six hours on, twelve hours on, six hours on, twenty-four, and then got to, we had a span of thirty-six hours. And during that time, that allowed us to hop a plane over. We went over the, a number of times to Kunming. 
Um, nothing. Well, one one experience we, we uh, the plane we were in happened to have carrying 55 gallon dump of gasoline. And we got over to Kunming and the uh, the light on the dash indicated that the landing gear hadn't locked. So the pilot started going going around to reduce gasoline. Then he realized we were full of gasoline. <laughs> There's nothing he could do about it. So we went in, and obviously it, they were okay, and we landed. Um, now, when you went into China, what did you do there? We just visited. Mm -hmm. Just visited. The uh, the barracks for our unit over on Kunming, China, was on the edge of the airfield, and uh, we would usually stay there and then walk across a, oh, several fields to go into the city. And what was interesting was that as you cross these fields, there was a Chinese soldier about every hundred yards, as far as you could see. And that was the front line for the battle between the nationalists and the communists. Of course, we didn't understand any of that at all. We had no concept of this other than it existed. And then every once in a while, one or the other side, we couldn't tell which, would take over Kunming. Didn't make any difference to us who was in charge. And uh, sometimes the fighting would get, we, one time we were there in the barracks and one night the, the bullets were kind of bouncing off the side of the barracks. They were fighting it out. Uh, China seemed much more much cleaner, nicer than India. And the Sam, I'll go back to that for a minute. The, the main, the, the main thing was tea. They grew on and big tea plantations, and the women would uh, did most of the work, as far as we could see. They wore the saris, and they'd have a sling on one shoulder to, to collect the tea, and the sling on the other shoulder to carry the baby. And they go out on the field and pick tea all day. And, most of the men just seemed to squat and chew beetle up all day long. It didn't seem to do much of anything. Um, I'll say the vibrations. We'd go to the USO. There was a USO in Conway. Uh, do you ever have any USO shows come in named? Nothing, no. Us? No, we were a pretty small group. Mm -hmm. Uh, when V-Day came, we weren't all that thrilled. Oh, at first, at first we lived in tents. The only, the only use we, we were issued, I don't know why we were issued trench knives on the Army Air Corps, but we were, and the only use I ever made of it was to cut the grass down, which was about a foot high in the, in the growing in the tent where we were to stay. Mm -hmm. And eventually we got as space became available, we were moved out of the tents and on into more more permanent quarters. Now, what kind of food did you have there? Army food, or did you get oh, no. local foods? Or there was army food, mm -hmm. pretty much. Uh, and I I don't have any reaction to it, except for the eggs. You know, they had a green tinge to them, mm -hmm. and the, the milk was terrible. It was chalk. We had a breakfast club. It was once a month to cook. Uh, was able to get some eggs and tomatoes from the natives, and we have a regular breakfast. <laughs> uh, but I don't. Uh, oh, one. I know. After the war, one story. After the war, uh, I was assigned to the mess hall. We weren't maintaining radio contact any longer, and I'd go down, take the jeep down, and get supplies, ice cream uh, in the afternoon and meat in the morning. And for about a month or so, all we got was stew meat. And the poor cook could only do so much with it. Well, the, well, the uh, word got out that there were pork chops down in the mess hall by the uh, airstrip. Well, everybody wound up down there. And I'll never forget it. And there was a line as long as you can imagine, waiting in line, and we each got a pork chop and you got a piece of it was sandwich, we make pork chop sandwich. And that was probably the best pork chop I guess I ever had. Uh, now, when you were in China, what did you have to eat there? Did you eat local foods or again military? There was a 
No, just military there, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. There was a Chinese restaurant that uh, was passable, it was quite good, and we used to eat there. Now, where you, where you were, were you ever, some others that we've uh, interviewed, there were tigers and elephants in the area, were you, did you have wildlife in the area that? There were monkeys, there was a mo monkey in that, uh, and dogs, or you, you mm -hmm. have a dog, but nothing, mm -hmm. nothing exotic. Mm -hmm. We, uh, at one point we lived in a basha that had a burlap ceiling that was uh, whitewashed stiff and uh, we had a family of rats living in the fascia and they, for some reason at night after we turned the lights out they'd run back and forth across the ceiling so we got some traps and we took turns setting the trap and then after it would snap whose ever turn it was have to get up empty the trap and reset it every night and we finally got rid of those those fellows but nothing no um, I've seen the only well, the exotic thing I can recall is that we did see uh, one of those fakers with his cobra coming out of the basket in Calcutta. Now that's taken us to the end of the war. Um, one interesting thing I guess was at the end of the war too, uh, they, we were, all the, all the units were, and of course we were all there waiting until the point count got mm -hmm. down to where we were. And uh, we were to turn our vehicles into a British motor pool. And that was pretty lax. And you drive along the roads and uh, there'd be say, an ambulance just sitting there. Keys in it, gas in it, just abandoned. So one of the guys had his own ambulance. There was a six by, there were several Jeeps. And so it wound up where, and our group now at this point was probably down to about 20 guys, you know. So each one had his own, his own uh, vehicle. And we each one wanted to drive his own vehicle to the movies. Well, they got to be, they thought the Russian army was coming, I guess, after a while, and we were reprimanded for that until we had to stop it. But there was plenty of gasoline, we just go down to the base and gas up and drive along. Um, And finally, um, let's see, the war of VJ Day came and, it was, and everything stopped. And as I say, I was assigned to the mess hall for a while. Nothing very demanding. What um, was the reaction among your unit when uh, the death of President Roosevelt was announced? Do you recall that? Or? No, I don't recall mm -hmm. uh, any unusual, uh, you know, reaction. Mm -hmm. How about when the atomic bombs were dropped? Did you, was there any reaction? Did you hear about that? Uh, well, there was. You see, with VJ, VE Day, mm -hmm. uh, that, was, that was a pleasant thing, Yes. but it didn't mean a lot to us because right. we thought we'd be there for a long time because, uh, you know, Japanese were tough and we thought we'd take years to, to lick them. And of course, when the atomic bomb was dropped and all of a sudden someone, uh, the whole different mm -hmm. prospect appeared and it was encouraging. Now were you ever under attack by Japanese aircraft? No, but not by the time we got mm -hmm. there. Okay. Uh, when we first got there, there were a couple of uh, British fighter plane strips still active, but they left shortly after that and uh, because the Japanese had been driven out of India mm -hmm. long before we got there. And then uh, on the way home we went to, we were taking a place called Dum Dum, which is outside of Calcutta. We were able to see Calcutta and uh, it's not an attractive place. Uh, what were your overall impressions of, of India? Primitive, where we were especially. In fact, I've often wondered what the natives thought when all of a sudden, now ox carts were, or, or the mode of transportation, that's at the level of their mm -hmm. development. And I thought what the natives thought when 
the U.S. Army came in with all this big equipment, with the U.S. Air Street, and all big planes flying in. And it generated a gap of years, centuries, really, in a way. Yeah. After you were discharged, did you make use of the GI Bill? Oh, yes. I finished Cornell for three mm -hmm. years. Did you use that 5220 club? It was uh, unemployment uh, insurance, $20 a week for 52 weeks. If you were unemployed, you could get... No, no, I don't, I never, I didn't okay. have to, no. Okay. Um, did you join any veterans organizations ever? No, no, I didn't. Um, how about staying in contact with anyone? Uh, I didn't. Stay in contact as much as I, now looking back on it, I wish I had. Mm -hmm. But again, I think when you get back, you go to school, go to college, and that's your thrust. And you get married, raising your family, and the medium for contact wasn't there, except for Jim Vandenacker, who put that brochure together that I showed. Mm -hmm. And Jim lives out in Idaho now, and he contacted me oh, about 10 years ago, out of the blue, found me on the internet and called me up. I was just amazed. I even remember. And we've been in touch ever since, yeah. Mm -hmm. How do you think your time in the service had an effect on your life? Well, one specific thing, I learned how to typewrite, <laughs> and that really stood me in good stead. Um, you have to understand, and I think I've described it fairly well, there was no real pressure, there was no battle here, there was none of that sort of mm -hmm. thing. And uh, I look back on it, it's just uh, not, a, not an unpleasant uh, experience. Not an unpleasant experience at all. Uh, I was glad I was able to serve. I feel guilty, as I say, watching the Ken Burns uh, documentary. But, uh, I probably should have done more, but well, I, the opportunity you wasn't there. You contributed. Um, if you held this up, tell us where and when that was taken. Well, yes, this was taken after I got back. After I got back home, this was taken in our backyard, and uh, I don't have my hat on, so I'm not really fully in uniform. But I, I'm sorry about that. Now well, this is your backyard. At Terry Town. Terry Town. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Now you have uh, the flight map, flight charts. If you. Yes, if this is of interest. Uh, yes. This is a AAF special flight chart, Kunming, China to Chamwa, India. And then these are the flight patterns over that terrain. And uh, I, I don't know, it's just... Looks like this might be of interest, I don't think I'll need it again. Maybe if you can hold one end of it, you oh. can hold the other end of it. All right. Take a look at this. All right. Well, these are different flight patterns uh, that the planes took. Chaba is over here, and then 500 miles over the over the Himalayas was coming here, and the, the, the these flight paths were, were all designated. What are they? Uh, Charlie, Abel. That sort of thing. This, yeah, this Charlie. Is this is Route Peter, Route Easy, Route Fox, and so forth. Mm -hmm. And actually, on this, if you look closely, the different checkpoints are designated. Um, well, there's checkpoint 210. And then when it hit that, they would call into us and say they had gone that far. And then they now, why were there so many different flight paths, depending on weather and so on? or? Well, yes, and volume. I mean, oh, they were okay. carrying tons, of, millions of tons of, of equipment. They were just constantly, as fast as they could leave, they'd, they'd fly so they and then were coming the planes back. flying at 24 hours a day, basically? Yes, yeah, pretty much. Yeah, some uh, more day than night, but some uh, pilots, I said, made as many as three trips a day. Mm -hmm. yeah. But all of this in this terrain here, they say there were no 
many unexplored portions had no idea what who lived there or what the languages were. The pilots or the air crew carried silk scarves. Oh yes, right. You've probably seen those yes, with right. the languages on them explaining their purpose mm -hmm. in as many languages as they knew. Okay, well thank you very much for your interview. I guess I covered everything. I I don't know. I'm